right, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from today. I'm um, Lindsay with Independent Sector. And before we start today, I just want to respectfully acknowledge that Independent Sector is um, headquartered in Washington, D.C., which is the ancestral home of the Nakachtank, Anacostan, and Piscataway peoples. We're still in the area and working to reclaim their land and traditional practices. I also want to acknowledge that many of the buildings and places that we inhabit in Washington, D.C. area were, were built with the labor of enslaved people. And now I want to welcome you to our program today about leading strategy during uncertain times. I'm Lindsay Markell, our membership, um, our manager of membership for independent sector, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, this event presented by Independent Sector in partnership um, with IS member, the Do Good Institute at the University of Maryland is especially for members of IS. Um, so as members, most of you know that Independent Sector is the only national membership organization that brings together a diverse community of change makers, uh, nonprofits, foundations, corporate giving programs, all working together to strengthen civil society and ensure all people in the US thrive. So before we dive in, um, just a couple housekeeping notes. Um, at any point during the event today, feel free to share your thoughts or put a question in the chat box. Um, please keep your microphones on mute except during the breakout groups portion of the program or um, when our speaker lets you know otherwise if you can unmute. Um, and finally, I just want to let you know that this um, event is being recorded and we will share slides um, with our registered participants. Um, might take a couple of days, so we appreciate your patience, but we'll get that out to you as soon as we can. Um, in addition to being a member of Independent Sector, the Do Good Institute is also a partner in Independent Sector's work, including our annual Value of Volunteer Time update, um, which was just announced last month in April. The Institute also aims to activate research and leadership that shapes the design of their hands-on educational initiatives and sparks approaches and actions that create a better world. Their research efforts address key gaps in the existing knowledge on doing good and address important questions essential to the future of our work. The Institute's early research efforts have already resulted in congressional testimony that served as a justification for a new National Generosity Commission and a Biden-Harris administration transition team request to advise on the new administration's nonprofit sector policies. As part of the Do Good Institute's social impact education and experiences, DGI also offers a graduate certificate in nonprofit management and leadership. And you can see a little bit more about that there. And now I'd like to invite our facilitator for today's event, um, Rob Sheehan from the University of Maryland. Um, welcome you to introduce yourself and get us started with the program today. All right, Lindsay, thanks so much. And uh, it's great to be with you all here today. And uh, before we get started with a formal introduction, I'll just say that um, I want to share with you the reason why I'm here. And I mean, why I'm here today with you all, but also uh, why I'm on the planet. And um, as I look out in the world, and I see the way the world is. Uh, I dream of what the world would be like if I could have it any way I wanted it. And then I compare that to the way the world really is today. And I don't know about you, but I, I imagine you feel the same way, is that when I dream of what the world would be like if I could have it any way I wanted, and the way it looks now, there's a gigantic difference between the two. Because I want a world that works for everybody with nobody left out, right? wonderful environment, you know, people are taken care of, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe that uh, nonprofit organizations play a key role in, um, in the importance of uh, bringing those two together and uh, creating a more ideal world. And I believe that a robust strategy for a nonprofit organization can be really helpful in, uh, in bringing it together and, uh, and leading us toward having that that, uh, that better kind of world. So anyway, that's why we're here. That's sort of the background for me. And with that, we'll kind of get started with um, uh, uh, some of the specifics of, uh, of today. So um, we're talking about, you know, leading strategy during uncertain times. And a uh, little bit about me, my background. Uh, I'm currently the academic director of the Executive MBA program at the Robert H. Smith School of Business, University of Maryland. I'm also an affiliate faculty member for the, two, for the Duke Institute. I teach the strategy course as part of that certificate program that Lindsay taught, uh, talked about a minute ago. Um, I have a volunteer job. I'm uh, the volunteer blog editor 
uh, for a blog that's at this website, insightswithimpact.org. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, go ahead and uh, multitask, uh, you can check that out. I'll be referring to it a couple of times uh, during our session today. And then I do a little consulting. I do some strategic planning consulting with nonprofits, again, in my, uh, in my free time. Uh, all right, so a little bit more about me. I got my PhD at Ohio State. I was able to uh, focus on studying really nonprofit performance, strategy, leadership, teamwork, things like that. My career background, I've been at the University of Maryland since 2001. But before that, though, I spent my, my career in the nonprofit world. I've got 18 years experience as the CEO of two different national nonprofits. Uh, I was a CFRE once upon a time. And, um, uh, and with all of that background, that led me uh, a number of years ago to write this book, Mission Impact, Break Strategies for Nonprofits. I'm talking about that uh, a lot today as we go through the session. So the idea today, in the short amount of time we have together, is I want to provide you with a taste of this breakthrough strategy approach that I uh, teach at the university and that is in the Mission Impact book. And then also give you some insights about, you know, leading strategy in uncertain times, being an you know, adaptive strategy, so giving some, some insights on being nimble and being adaptive to our ever-changing environment, which we certainly got a big taste of here uh, two plus years ago with COVID. One important thing that I always make sure to mention whenever I talk about strategy is that nothing that I, <laughs> that I teach anybody about strategy is gonna work unless you've got great leadership in your organization. Leadership is required to create great strategy, to implement it, and, uh, and to lead across the board. When I say, leadership. I'm talking about ethical, inclusive, authentic, empowering leadership. That to me is what quality leadership all of, is all about. And it uh, contributes to building a more just, equitable, and thriving society. So I always want to make sure to point out the importance of leadership. Uh, okay, so a quick quiz. If we were in a classroom, I'd ask you to raise your hands. You know, how many of you think people, most people in the nonprofit world work really hard? Yes, everybody's hands go up. How many of you think that most people in the nonprofit world are really smart? Yes, all the hands go up, right? So here's the thing. Um, we know that people in the nonprofit world work really hard and are very smart. And yet, unfortunately, so often what happens is we're only able to make sort of small incremental changes in, uh, in the world. And uh, when, we, when I talked at the beginning about this chasm between, you know, the way the world would be if I could have it any way I wanted it, and I'm sure it's true for you as well, and the way it is now, we want more than incremental change. And in his excellent book, Leap of Reason, Mari Marino is one of the one of the uh, things that he says in that book is that incremental change is not enough. We need to do better. So the intention of this whole breakthrough strategy approach that I'm going to share with you today is to drive higher levels of innovation and creativity throughout an organization so you can make even more of a mission impact. That is sort of the big picture. And I believe that in order to do that, we need a new mindset. So let me give you an example. <clears throat> um, I've been teaching this whole idea of breakthrough thinking for a long time. And um, really, I've had a chance to teach it all over the world. And every time I teach it, uh, the next day when I get up and I get ready to do my morning exercise, as I will do tomorrow, I reflect back on that day before and I think to myself, okay, how could I have done that better? What, what kind of insights could I be shared? You know, how did that all go? And I kind of replay it in my mind and think about how I could do that better. Once upon a time, I was having that morning reflection uh, during my morning run, and I was thinking back to the day before, and I had been teaching a half-day session on breakthrough thinking to a group of executives um, in Zurich, Switzerland, and the executives had been at this uh, university called the ETH, uh, so it's right there in, in uh, Switzerland, in Zurich, it is the uh, Swiss Science University, all right, and so the next morning I woke up, crystal clear morning in Zurich, I'm getting up to take my run, and this was sort of my inspirational, this isn't exactly what it looked like, but something like this. Uh, this is my inspirational background that I had as I was taking my morning run and thinking about how I had taught the day before. And at the ETH, again, the Swiss National Science University, this is where Einstein had both been a student and a professor. So I want you to imagine what it's like teaching in the ETH. You're sitting there in the front of the classroom teaching and thinking, wow, I mean, Einstein, you know, for all the years he was there, Einstein probably taught in this very same classroom that I'm teaching. And so as I was taking my run, I was thinking back, I was thinking about Einstein, and I remembered this quote from Einstein. And I think what he's trying to tell us 
you know, it's Einstein that reportedly said that uh, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, that's the definition of insanity, right? We've all heard that. So I'm thinking what when Einstein, the incredible innovator, the just, you know, incredible thinker, he said, we've got to think differently. We need a new mindset. We need to have new patterns of thought if we're going to really create breakthroughs. And so what I'm going to ask you to do during the next, whatever, 50 minutes that we have left together if, is to really think like Einstein, right? So be an Einstein thinker. And then also another great quote here from George Bernard Shaw. What Shaw basically is telling us is this. Most people, and this is, which is a very reasonable thing to do, most people, what they do is they, they get up in the morning. So it's here, May 3, 2022. And you, you know, kind of look at the world and uh, you adapt yourself to it. It's a very reasonable thing to do. What Shaw says is that unreasonable people dream of what they want first, and they try to adapt the world to themselves. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you, you know, the next you know 45, 50 minutes we have together, think like Einstein and be a little bit unreasonable because I'm gonna share some thoughts with you that maybe it's like I don't know, Rob. I don't know if that could really work, but please keep an open mind and think like Einstein and be a little bit unreasonable. Let's talk first before we get into breakthrough thinking uh, about this whole question of leading adaptive strategy. We've been through COVID during the last, you know, 26, 27 months, right? And, and we've learned that, wow, you can have a, you can have a, what you think is a great strategy, but all of a sudden you could be knocked, uh, you know, knocked sideways. Uh, so what do you do? How do you lead through with an adaptive strategy? My first suggestion is that uh, first you've got to have a robust strategy. And I'll tell you something, I've been in this work for a long, long time. And one of the reasons that I'm so focused on strategy is because I have seen that as the key missing element in so many organizations. And as we go out through the day today, if you pick up some insights, you might be able to go back and help your organization sort of you know, fix up your strategy a little bit. So the first thing is to really have a robust strategy as we're gonna be discussing through the rest of the day today. Second key point, part of a robust strategy in my view is to identify your strategic assumptions. All right. Now, this is, you know, I taught this before COVID. All right. So this is just not, not about COVID. We just want to think about what are the key assumptions we've got about, you know, our internal capabilities as well as what's going on in the external world. We've got to identify those, like literally write them down. What are our most important assumptions we're making as we enter the next period of our, of our strategy? And, uh, and then monitor those over time. Right. So the leadership team of an organization has got to keep an eye on those. And it's got to monitor those. To get even more specific, you've probably all heard about SWOT analysis. SWOT means identify your strengths, your weaknesses, the opportunities in the environment, and the threats in the environment. And I would say, remember the T in SWOT. Remember the threats. So you identify those through the strategic planning process. And then it's got to be somebody's job to keep an eye on the threats because you need a plan to deal with them. And um, not all threats can be identified early on in a process, right? Three years ago, nobody doing strategy said, well, one threat might be we'll have a global pandemic, right? You're not gonna, you're not gonna set that as a threat. So some, some things can happen you're not gonna think of. We, we can uh, you know, talk about that in our last bullet, but you wanna identify what you can as potential threats and then keep an eye on those things. To that point, one tool that can be really helpful in leading adaptive strategy is what we call scenario planning. Now, I'll give you a real specific example. A number of years ago, I was doing strategic planning with this nonprofit, and uh, they were in the healthcare space. <clears throat> and uh, this was about probably maybe, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And, um, and at the time uh, that our strategy work was just finishing up, the Supreme Court was getting ready to make a look, monumental um, uh, decision that would impact Obamacare, which would impact this organization in a big way. So we're like, boy, this is kind of you know, challenging to be creating strategy in this kind of uh, environment. But we said, okay, look, you know, what's going to happen? Well, pretty easy to identify. You know, pretty much, and you never know what the Supreme Court's going to do, but pretty much they're one of three things that we all knew were going to happen. So in, in our calm strategic planning you know, room, we said, okay, either they're going to do A, B or C. If they do A, what are we going to do? If, they're, if they do B, what are we going to do? And if they do C, what are we going to do? And the nice thing about, strategic, about scenario planning 
is you're able to calmly, uh, without panic, take some time and make these, you know, three different plans of what you're going to do. Uh, it can be really helpful in, especially those of you who maybe politics impact your work a lot. So, well, if this happens at the midterm elections, you know, one thing happens, that thing, you know, we need to know how to pivot one way or the other. So scenario planning can be a really helpful tool. And then finally, uh, my last suggestion is that you build organizational resilience. And this is especially important for the unknown, like we had with COVID. Um, you know, I was asked a lot when COVID hit, <clears throat> people were like, Rob, what do we do? What do we do? And I did a lot of, you know, free webinars for people. And I told people at the time, I said, one of our problems right now is we have a lot of non-resilient organizations being led by a lot of non-resilient people. And COVID has created more of a problem for them because of that. So let's talk about, and again, if you want to go to the insightswithimpact.org uh, website, my blog website, after class, and, and plug in resilience uh, into the search, you'll find some, some interesting articles about that. But here's the thing, let's talk about personal resilience first. As individuals and leaders in, in any organization, you've got to build your, your, personal or, you know, your personal resilience. Take care of yourself, right? The importance of self-care, the importance of being able to um, you know, have a calm mindset so that when on a daily basis, you know, a crisis might hit, you've got to be the kind of leader that is taking care of your health, taking care of your mind, and taking care of your ability to stay calm in, in a challenging situation. You've got to be personally resilient. So I'll encourage you after this session is to, you know, do a little, you know, report card for yourself and just say, you know, am I taking care of myself? Am I ready, ready for the next big challenge personally? Because we need an organization of resilient people and encourage everybody you work with to, to you know, work on their self-care and their personal resilience. Second thing is we need organizational re resilience. I don't have to tell you, you know, I've been working in the nonprofit world a long time. Way too many organizations <clears throat> operate on a shoestring. Uh, they, they don't have reserves, uh, which is, you know, one of the main things that can help you in a challenging situation, um, you know, in building organizational resilience. But it's more than that. So really look at your organization and ask yourself, are, are we built to last? You know, are we able to, you know, how did we do during COVID? I'll tell you. The spectrum is gigantic of, of how COVID impacted nonprofit organizations. We could probably sit down, you know, for the next hour and just have each one of you tell your story about what happened in your organization. But I tell you what, you know, I have done work the last couple of years of organizations that I would tell you barely messed them up at all. Didn't impact their funding, um, didn't impact, impact their programs. Yes, they had to wear masks. Yes, they had to work from home. But in terms of carrying out their mission, did hardly mess them up at all, all right? And others who, like where I used to work and where I was a board member, uh, the leadership organization, they put on their main, their main programs are in-person uh, ethics-based leadership programs for college students. Well, nobody's do, been doing in-person stuff like residential 24 hours for six days was, you know, their main program. Nobody's doing that. So they kind of been on the shelf. They had to go to do a lot of remote things. They had to do a lot of online learning. But still, they had to downsize dramatically. Fortunately, they had a lot of reserves, so they can kind of wait until things open up, and they'll rise again and, and do this. But building organization resilience is, is really important. Now, uh, why don't I take a quick time out and uh, stop sharing my screen and just see if anybody if you have any just quick questions based on that. Just use your, uh, use your hand raise or, or raise your hand. I can see this group of you and uh, questions just about the whole adaptive strategy, organizational resilience. Any questions on that before we dive more into strategy? Okay, I'm gonna keep going because we got lots to cover. All right, so Rob, how do we create a robust strategy? Glad you asked. Here are the different parts to it. One, you wanna create something I call a mission gap. We'll talk about that in a second. Then you wanna use an aspirational mindset to create a vision, and uh, strategic stretch goals. Once you do that, you would identify your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and your threats, and then you create a strategy narrative. We'll talk about what that is. So let's talk about uh, your, your mission in a second. I believe that all of you uh, received this uh, Breakthrough Strategy Workbook, which complements the Mission Impact book. I'll just encourage you to follow that along if you have it with you. We're gonna be going through the steps in that. And if you haven't, we'll make sure you get that uh, later on. 
And uh, one thing you can look at as a part of the, um, the, the workbook is, I think this is on like page 18 or 19, something like that. This is the strategy development map that we're gonna be looking at. And we begin our strategy journey in the ideal future, which is where I like to spend a lot of my time in the ideal future. So with that in mind, we're gonna talk about your mission impact. Here's what I'd like you to do. I would like you to imagine what the world would look like if your organization was accomplishing your mission 100%. Wow, would that be cool or what? So imagine what the world would look like if your organization was accomplishing your mission 100%. And then I want you to compare that to the way the world looks today. And the difference between those two, I'll suggest I call uh, your mission gap. So we're just going to give you a minute to think about that for a moment. Just, just what do you, what would the world look like if you were accomplishing your mission 100%? And what is that? How would that compare to the way the world is now? I'm going to give you a chance to share this in breakout rooms. So uh, make sure you're ready to uh, to share with some of your uh, colleagues here. What would the world look like if you're accomplishing your mission 100%? If you could really have it any way you wanted it, and you were accomplishing your mission 100%, what would, what would the world look like, and how does it look now? All right, we're just about ready to open up the breakout rooms. What I'm going to do is just ask you to take a few minutes each to uh, share with each other uh, what your thoughts are about this. And, um, you know, really, you know, dream big. If you really were accomplishing your mission 100%, uh, what, would, uh, what would the world look like and how does it look now? So rooms are now open. Got one more person who just came into the session, so I want to want to get him into a room. Rooms are open. Take about a minute or two each and, uh, and share um, what would the world look like if you're accomplishing your mission 100% and what it looks like now. Go ahead and share. Joellen, if I'm Joellen, if I'm pronouncing your name right, or did you get put into a room? Okay, welcome back. I'm, welcome back. I'm sure somebody was mid sentence saying something brilliant right when I, when when you were when you brought back into the in the room, and I I hope you had the opportunity to share some great things. Yes, what would the world look like if you were accomplishing your mission 100? That's the kind of world I want. I want to live in the world where all of you all, all nonprofits, are accomplishing your mission 100. So this mission gap, the difference between 
you know, what the world would look like if you're accomplishing your mission 100% and the way the world is now. This is the first important thing following the mission impact breakthrough strategy approach that you want to do. Here's an example. You know, I don't know if you know, but uh, the, the illiteracy rate in America is about 20%. So in an average county in the U.S. of 100,000 adults, there are 20,000 adults who are not literate. That does not work for me, right? We need everybody to be able to, to you know, to read. This is like at a sixth grade level. And uh, that's the kind of world I want as an example. So this is an, an example of a mission gap. And what I'm going to suggest now is that, you know, if you've got a mission gap, that's that huge or bigger, you need a breakthrough strategy. You don't want just incremental you know, improvements. You wanna have big chunks of improvement on that. And that's the first thing we wanna do is say, okay, the purpose now of creating a strategy is to close your mission gap as effectively as possible. That's your first little takeaway. If there's a test at the end of the day, that would be on the test. The purpose of the mission gap is then to give us something to create a strategy for, and strategy helps us to close that gap. The next thing you wanna do, now that we've got the mission gap identified, is to create an aspirational vision followed by aspirational goals. So, you know, you've heard about vision a lot and the importance of vision. Uh, another George Bernard Shaw, great quote, some people see things as they are and say, oh, I dream of things. Never were and say, why not? Dr. King uh, had a, a dream. Uh, so we wanna dream big here. We wanna use this aspirational mindset. One of my mentors passed away a number of years ago, Dr. Russ Acoff. Russ was a, a, a leader, a pioneer in the whole area of systems thinking. So to Russ, everything was a system. When he talked about vision, he talked about an organization creating a, a vision. Uh, he talked about an organization as a system. And Russ said, and this is really interesting, vision approach. Russ called visioning idealized design. And he said, step one is pretend that last night the organization or the system was destroyed. So I want you to think about that for a minute. Imagine the last night your organization was uh, destroyed, and now it's your job this morning to take a clean sheet of paper and no resourcing constraints whatsoever, invent a brand new organization. That's what idealized design is all about. And what's cool about it is that, you know, your organization was destroyed last night, so maybe you're sad because there was some good stuff in there. Well, fine. You now have got your clean sheet of paper. You can go ahead and reinvent all those good things back. And, uh, and then more. Now, so I, I teach visioning through the idealized design lens. And uh, when I was writing the Mission Impact book, Russ Acoff had already passed away. I couldn't ask him more detailed questions, but I, my friend, Gerald Suarez, who worked closely with Russ for many years, um, sat down with me and we had a long talk about idealized design. And this particular quote I thought was so important. He said, Rob, when you say the system was destroyed last night, you not only destroy the system, you destroy all the constraints with it. And usually what I find is when you try to say to people, I want you to dream what your organization would be like if you could have it any way you wanted it. The first thing they often think of are problems they have and how they would fix them. But you don't need to worry about that. The problems were destroyed last night. So there's nothing to fix. All you have is a clean sheet of paper with unlimited resources that you can invent your organization anew. Again, keep all the great stuff you had, but forget about all the problems, they're gone, and just invent a lot of good new stuff. So this is what I'd like you to think about next. As you think about your mission gap, then ask yourself, what would our organization look like ideally so we could close our mission gap as effectively as we possibly can, all right? So here's an example of idealized design. I was teaching this uh, a number of years ago, as a consultant to an organization in Baltimore, the Ronald McDonald House. And I was uh, orienting their board to the strategy process we're gonna use. And I gave them this little talk and I said, I'm gonna ask you to dream of what the Ronald McDonald House uh, of Maryland would look like if you could have it any way you wanted. And right away, you know, a person's hand in the back of the room, you know, came up and she said, a brand new house. And uh, we were actually meeting in the current Ronald McDonald House at the time. And another person said, hey, look, Come on. Uh, I've been walking around the house right now and uh, earlier before this meeting, and uh, we got a couple million dollars worth of improvements we need to do to this house. Money by, by the way, that we don't have. All right. New house? I don't think so. Fortunately, uh, the board chair said, hey, what could have hurt us to dream a little bit? And boy, did they dream. They dreamed, they dreamed, they dreamed. And they dreamed this $32 million house 
property that they didn't have, right? They had to get the property, they had to get the money. And sure enough, they started dreaming and they started dreaming and sharing their dreams with other people. And the dream started coming true. This is um, February 1, 2019, where I could visit with Sandy Pagnotti, their CEO, as the house was kind of coming together. And, uh, and here's uh, May of 2019 with a Ronald McDonald house in Baltimore, brand new opening. Dreamed big, had no idea. If I would have told them on the first night that, oh, new house, oh, absolutely, you guys can do that. I would have probably been fired that night as a consultant. But they dreamed, they were inspired, they inspired others, and they made it happen. So that's the next step in this process. Dream an aspirational vision for your organization. What would it look like if you could have it any way you wanted it with no resource constraints? So that's using the aspirational mindset and that's step two in the process. The next thing we wanna do is we wanna set some goals because we know goals are really important. You all know all about goals that, um, you know, they, they direct your attention, they keep you focused, they, they keep you persistent. And so this part of the process, <clears throat> I encourage you to set three to five, outcome-based uh, strategic stretch goals uh, that are SMART, all right? Now, you guys know a lot about SMART goals. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Think about your organization. Think about your mission gap. Think about the little dream you started dreaming about what your organization would look like if you could have it any way you wanted. And think about this. Think about one, what is one big goal that you would set for your organization if you knew you could not fail and it would help you close your mission gap. Like a big goal for the next three to five years. What, would, what one big goal would you set for your organization if you knew you could not fail? And this, this big goal accomplishing it would help you close your mission gap and help you further that vision you have. I'm gonna give you a minute to sort of brainstorm on your own and we'll put you back in your breakout rooms to share. What one big goal would you set for your organization if you, you absolutely could not fail at it? What would you do? I see Steven, he's dreaming big there. He's like, ah, what would I do? Mm -hmm. what, when, what one big goal would you set for your organization if you knew you couldn't fail? Like for the next three to five years, a big strategic goal. All right, take a couple of minutes each to share your goals. The, the breakout rooms are open and uh, share, your big, share your big goals with each other. All right, welcome back, welcome back. Uh, you know, hope you had some fun with that. Um, and you know, some of you may be saying, okay, Rob, that's, that, that, was some, that was fun. We enjoyed sharing our big goals with each other. But, you know, Rob, I was taught goal setting. You know, you, you, you should only set a goal if, uh, if you're sure you're going to accomplish it. And probably many of you were taught goal setting this way, right? This is a traditional version of a SMART goal where you set goals that are attainable. You're almost sure you can accomplish it or you, or you don't set it that way. But guess what? I asked you to think like Einstein. I asked you to think unreasonably. This is how I teach goal setting. I suggest you set goals that are almost impossible that you use a new A for SMART. Why would I suggest such a thing? Because one of my favorite sayings is that great leaders have a healthy disregard for the impossible. Think about it. Uh, in your lifetimes, all the things that people happened, that people said were impossible. Space travel, TV, people said will not be commercially feasible. That the voice can't be transmit, transmitted over wires. The machine's never going out to the horse. And this is my favorite one. That rail travel high speeds, not possible. Passengers unable to breathe would die of asphyxia. Right? How funny. And one reason I, I think that's so funny is that uh, many years ago, I had the opportunity to visit to Shanghai, China. And on my way back to the airport, the cab driver's flying along. And out of the side of the window, there's something whooshed by. I said, what was that? And he said, oh, uh, maglev train. And I was like, man, if I ever get a chance to come back here, I'm going on that thing. And sure enough, a year later, I got to take the maglev train from downtown Shanghai the Pudong Airport, and I'll tell you something, that thing went 285 miles an hour, smooth as could be, and guess what? I did not die of asphyxia. Now, why did I tell you that fun little story? 
because the way those trains were invented is that the Japanese train executives went to their engineers one day and they said, look, right now it takes about six and a half hours to take the train from Osaka to Tokyo. We want you to build us a train, train to do it in three hours. Wow. Not please make some improve, please make the train faster, right? If they said, please make the train faster, the engineers would have gone back and, you know, they would have tweaked what they already had. <clears throat> Not now, no tweaking. They had to totally forget everything they knew about trains, reinvent a brand new technology for trains. And this is how mag magnetic levitation was, was invented. So this is the opportunity that's involved in creating an almost impossible goal is you create the goal with no idea about how you're going to accomplish it. And when you do that, you need to tap into your growth mindset. You know, a fixed mindset says, well, I know everything already. And so I know it's possible. I know it's not possible. And then, you know, th this, this kind of, you know, a train, it's impossible to have a train go twice that fast. Give me a break, right? Um, it's impossible within your mindset. But if you have a growth mindset, you can learn big things. Or as Helen Keller said, you know, life is during adventure or nothing. And Mandela, you're playing small does not serve those. So think of big goals. This is the next step in the aspirational um, vision, uh, pardon me, the aspirational goal setting process as a part of creating a breakthrough is to set three to five strategic goals that are that inspire you, that are almost impossible and will catapult you toward closing your mission gap, right? That's the next step in this, uh, in this process. In my Angelo, if you don't try these kinds of things, you'll never know how amazing you can really be. And Eleanor Roosevelt taught us we have to try to do the thing we think we cannot do. And I love this from Tom Peters. You try something and maybe you don't make it all the way. Uh, you get smarter faster. By the way, you'll get a copy of these slides for more on goal setting. I've got a set of uh, YouTube videos, again, all free, that you can learn more about the power of goals. I encourage you to check them out, share them with other people. All right. So again, we're following the process along. We've got our mission gap. We know what the world will look like. If we're accomplishing our mission 100%. And we want to close that mission gap. So we create a vision for our organization. What the organization would look like, you know, ideally, so we could close that mission gap. And now getting a little more real, a little more real, we've said, okay, we want to create for the next three to five years, we want to create these three to five strategic goals that we think are almost impossible. We can kind of imagine it can happen, but we think they're almost impossible. We're going to need to invent some new ways of, of making this happen. And then that will, uh, that will lead our, our breakthrough strategy. So on the sort of strategy development map, we started out in the ideal future with our ideal mission gap, our vision, and now our goals. And now, now finally, we're going to pay attention to current reality. Because the next thing we're going to do is say, okay, this. Now that we have this brand new context, right, this commitment to closing the mission gap, this commitment to this vision for our organization, and this commitment to these goals, now that we have that <clears throat> sort of context and that commitment. Now, with that in mind, we're going to look back into our current reality and we're going to ask ourselves a question. All right, let's look at our current organization. What strengths do we have that might help us achieve these almost impossible goals? What, what weaknesses do we have that we're going to have to work on if we're going to accomplish these big goals? What opportunities do we see out in the environment that can maybe help us uh, achieve these goals? And then what threats do we need to make sure we address um, in order to achieve these goals? So that's the next step is getting clarity on our current reality. And this is the way we ask the question is given our vision and the commitment we have to the goals and closing the mission gap, what are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? And I'll call a quick timeout right here to say that the way most uh, strategic planning is done is they start with this question before setting your goals. And I say, do it the exact opposite, like Einstein do it differently. All right, we're going to bring it home here. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Once you have all this together, you've got your SWOT ideas, you've got your goals, you've got your vision, you've got your mission gap, you put it all together in what we call a strategy narrative. It's a story about how your organization is going to go into the future. <clears throat> a strategy really is um, misunderstood by a lot of people, but an integrated and coherent explanation about how you're going to guide your performance into the future. It's a creative act. So basically the story is this, it's like, okay, here's the vision and goals we have for the future. <clears throat> How are we gonna leverage our strengths, fortify our weaknesses, seize our opportunities and block our threats to get us into the future? That's what a strategy narrative is and that finishes up our process. Now, I'm gonna open the floor for you know, a couple minutes of questions, but first I wanna share with you my 
Seven Deadly Sins of Nonprofit Strategy. This is in the workbook. If you have it, I hear this so often, this first sin. So many people hire a consultant, consultant comes up with a plan, and then people never follow it. You need to be intimately involved in your strategic planning so it's your plan and doesn't sit on the shelf. You've got to involve stakeholders. Don't just have this insular planning process. Involve stakeholders in a big way at the beginning. Um, I'm here actually, uh, I'm coming to you live from the uh, annual meeting of the Association of Fundraising Professionals, 2000, my best friends fundraisers from all over the US. And you know, oft, so often when they think about strategy, they think only about fundraising. It's much broader than that. Oftentimes people rush it. It can't be rushed, you gotta take your time. You've gotta have a real strategy, not just detailed plans. You've got to review it annually. That's how you make sure it doesn't go, um, that you're, 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 not, you're missing your assumptions. And then finally, it's got to be ambitious. Again, like Mandela said, your plain small does not serve the world, world. You've got to think big. Margaret Mead said it. Never doubt that such a small group of people can change the world. You, you can do it. I know you're already doing great things in your communities. I know you can do a lot more. I really appreciate everything you, you do. And I appreciate you taking the time to visit here, learn a little bit about uh, Breakthrough Strategy. And uh, you'll get a copy of these slides. You can uh, uh, look back at them. And with that, I want to open the floor for any you know couple of questions you might have and then turn things over to the independent sector people to close things out. Thanks for sticking with us uh, for this uh, fast, fun-filled uh, hour. But questions anybody has you'd like to, like to ask? Lucy's like, no, I got it. Okay, good to go. Well, there's a lot to do yet, <laughs> but, I, but I get what you're saying. I, <laughs> yeah, I know it was a fast, you know, overview, but um, you know, they gave me uh, they gave me an hour, and I tried to pack as much in there as I possibly could. For you. My name is Brad. I'm on the IS Communications staff. This is a fantastic conversation. I do want to let our IS members uh, ask a question because I don't. It, it's this is designed for them, so go for it. But if not, I have a question. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll ask it quickly. Rob, I'm just trying to figure out, it seems to me like some people in life in the nonprofit world have an aversion to thinking big. So what is this mental mind block about thinking big? How do you get around it? What kind of, what would you say? Because we need to think big to get to places. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting, Brad. So this is part of what I've committed my life to doing, right? Is helping people think out, think outside of the box. Uh, it's funny, <clears throat> you know, I told you I'm here at this conference uh, two nights ago. Uh, it's kind of fun because, you know, the first conference I've been to in three years. And uh, I saw a guy that uh, I did strategic planning with years ago with his organization. He's like, Rob, I tell the bullet train story all the time. So, Brad, what I try to do is to tell people stories, right? It's like, look, think about, you know, nobody thought the bullet train. That's such a, that's ridiculous. I promise you, those Ronald McDonald out Peace people, they never, I mean, if I go on one day, guess what? I bet you guys can raise three children. They didn't think that. So you got to start small and you got to, then you got to, you got to dream and you got to support people in that. And also you can't lie to them. It's like, look, this is not a promise, right? Not every big dream is going to happen, but look, start with your heart. What do you care about? That's why we start with mission gap. Start with your heart. What do you really care about? What would the world look like if you could, if you'd really have it any way you wanted it, you'd be accomplishing your mission 100%. You would be. Right now, it can sometimes hurts to dream that big because then you, you compare it to where you are, and like, oh my gosh, there's so many people we got to reach, and it can be a little bit depressing. But it, that gap, we are the people that have said we're going to stand in that gap, we're going to serve as many people as possible, we're going to close the gap as much as we can. So it can be a little bit depressing, but we got to focus on the inspiration, we're going to focus on helping, supporting as many people or whatever we can for the environment as much as we can. So, I, Brad, I find telling stories, trying to get people in a group, start with your heart. What do you really care about? And then let's dream. Let's do as much as we possibly can. And, and who knows what's possible? Because crazier things have happened. Not everything. I mean, I could tell you many more stories about, about things uh, that I, I never thought could happen that, that I've been a part of that did. And you know what? I can tell you a lot of stories of, of almost impossible goals that I've set that went nowhere. I'm working on a few right now. So you never know. But if you start with your heart, you start with what you care about, and you say, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'm going to try to try some new creative things because the new creative things I tried yesterday didn't work out very well. So now we're going to try something else. I see we're at our time. Uh, IS team, thank you again for inviting us. Um, maybe someday I'll see one of you in my one of my certificate uh, 
uh, of nonprofit management classes at Maryland. I would love that. And um, I'm going to be quiet and turn over to them. Well, thank you, Rob, for leading this session. It was a wonderful whirlwind of strategy. Um, and we really appreciate the New Good Institute for co-hosting with us and our members, of course, for joining us today. Um, we hope you'll take a quick minute, even though you know, we're a little over, um, to share your feedback in um, the survey link that's shared there in the chat. Um, please know that you know we read all of your feedback and it's so helpful to us as we think about opportunities um, to learn together with our members this year. Um, and we also want to welcome you to join us for our second Upswell pop-up of the year next month, um, June 21st. That will be focused on bridge building skills to help change makers um, continue to tackle the challenges of building a healthy and racially just nation. Um, so definitely feel free to register for that. Um, and it's not posted on the IS website yet, but we're also planning to hold an event about nonprofit financial accountability trends in June. So be on the lookout for more on that coming soon. Thanks again for joining us today. Thanks everyone.